Good evening, everyone. I am Tim Tima, Director of Communications with the NT. This is the NT Live for October 9th, Wednesday. On my right is my co host for this hour, Marcus Cook, who is our Youth Progression um, Director. On his right is one of our deputy political leaders, Ms. Lorraine Boucher. On my left, Ms. Russell Chan, um, former candidate for the Mountain Central Local Government um, District, as well as our constituency custodian for the Mountain Central. On his side here is a man who needs no introduction, Errol Fabian, our uh, custodian for Point Quartet. And the lovely young lady in the corner here is Shanta Alexander. Director of Women's Empowerment, he's also a former LG candidate. And we're going to be discussing, Mark, we're going to be discussing um, the budget and what it means for Trinidad and Tobago, what it means for the NT and so we will be um, moving forward. What we saw in the budget, in the last six of us on the communication, we think that's you know, allocation and this place within the set of tourism. Well, the allocation. It's like that. You know, the number was called for the allocation of the level, except for the four million dollars that we want to spend to fix the number of the people. But generally, people, if they don't know their destination, they don't know where to find their destination, they don't know when they're going to search in that Trinidad and Tobago is an island. Uh, uh, we probably like offers still. Of events and tours and experiences because tourism is not a tangible thing, it's an intangible thing for creating experiences. So that means every time you land, so you leave, it's an experience that is being created. And if you don't have certified, qualified people to, to deliver the product, um, and that takes us from immigration all the way to then we have a problem. So that I don't think we have emphasis on place on looking at standards and certification. Yes, they spoke about funding, and I remember when I took that there for when I took them apart. Most of the funding went to pay the people on the boards that mm -hmm. don't have the tourism accreditation. Mm -hmm. Yes, but very often it's previous. There was no funding that was allocated, and I didn't see that in this one either, that was allocated mm -hmm. to the overseas marketing. And the destination of marketing and creating the brand, the trend of the by the speaking up of that. And I, I think they gave lip service a lot of stuff. And for example, the maritime sector, the maritime sector, yachts, yachting industry here, tried up to nine years ago, was an amazing industry. Okay, in that all the yachting is a common thing because they don't get insurance of life because it's very easy. We want them down here. And we are out of the best. So that was the best place for them to be. So a lot of them could not get insurance. Therefore, they would come down here because they would stay up. And then they would get the insurance, okay? Because they import infinite balance to Vegas. And the money earned through that sector is absolutely amazing. Because they come into fix their work, it's going to do a lot of stuff. So I'm going to be unhappy about the fact that I have not seen that. Really collaborate with the private sector, which is the actually delivering the products to understand what we need to make this a viable product, which also has the opportunity to create many, many products in supply chain. No, you know, this, um, I, I, I was pretty to look at the release that you did, right? That will, will be released in public uh, tomorrow, right? As part of a collection of releases, um, as a newsletter from the NT, we will respond pretty well. Right, <laughs> and you know, I, I was fascinated by it by, by what you wrote about the whole concept of in the aftermath of Bell, we had such a, 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 a letter that Trinidad to Diego is the destination, is the destination, wherever there's a hurricane in the in 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 you know, in the state, they all went they all went there. Right, and this is not the of course, the of our Caribbean brothers, but uh, and sisters, sorry, but 
you know, how we constructively be released. We're so hard to think and so looking forward, right? In the sense that why not why aren't we taking that blank? You know, this is it, you know. I I ask myself, you know, why aren't we taking that But more importantly, you know, part of what we're doing is talking about the way forward. What is the end here? Plans, strategies, ideas, concepts. And so tell me a little bit about it. Well, one of the things is that we went into the port in Trinidad is extremely limited. There is so much wreckage and the systems are just falling. So you find that they can not never come out when you do a set of people and say, but you say, but what can I say? All the red tape, you know, um, that they have to go through. That they were really going to try to pick up country or island that they don't have to go through all that. You know, because you're already seven million overseas, you have to come down here. So, okay, they go to Grenada. But if we have to make it seamless. We have to make it seamless. It is not seamless. So, they have a lot of problems. The, Hold on, my country functions are the city of Shalanama area of the country of the state. Okay, they, they, first of all, they put it in here, and I can tell you, I will talk to them because they have done a good job. Because when we saw it, they were the, they came forward and helped the boats down in Shalanama, the people who, who have businesses in Shalanama, and the cooperators association with our president of. We have three or four members who have we, we and we put them anywhere. So we got to So my friends are on this whole thing with my and it's called on the children come. If they change that whole concept of having a military program and separate military culture, we have a culture and program. I'm not going to go into your area with it. Thank you very well. Because they're not paying any attention in that industry on tourism. And we, at the end, will ensure that tourism is going to be made a priority in the tourist sector because the opportunities for people to incredible in the tourism is far and wide. Not only is it that side, the fact that they are going to be to organize the sites and attract them to their food and feed the other things. It's so many, it's so many different things. So I don't think they have paid the attention. And I'm glad to hear that you like me, we really completed, but we really paid for life. Thank you. So, you know, what Marcus and I were speaking about when he was yesterday, one of the whole concept of that symbiotic relationship between and that integration between ministries and government entities. And, you know, to segue into the business of failure. Right. Um, when he was talking about tourism and maritime industry and so forth, and and the separation of um, the ship tourism from culture, I know you also wrote a very very powerful uh, release that will we will be seeing tomorrow. Right about culture and, and what it needs from the what from the end game. Okay, let me share some of that. Thanks, uh, Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Um. So. But I want to start at the place where Lorraine left off because tourism, culture, and the arts could not be in the same ministry in my right. estimation. If they have the same minister, mm -hmm. you know, if they have the same minister for so two ministries, fine. But for well, mm -hmm. those two entities that end up in the same ministry, they are spread in the old All right. Um, it felt very much in this budget that arts and culture went really well. It's taken for granted. You know, the case of no our arts and culture is kind of personal. And it is so much more than that. So very, very much more than that. And I would like when Tim to see that cohesive interministerial conversation going on. As, as the country moves forward, because we can't develop in in silos. We can't develop in silos. We have to, to develop everything to wrap the ground. Then we will save a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort if we are 
if you have a platform where everybody is in and everybody makes a piece of the understanding of what's really going so and it brings me to the role of arts and culture because it is a civilizing feature arts and culture you know it is the thing that all ministries and all sectors use in so many different ways we always follow in the hands you know so make a global but something that will happen we call in an artist we will set up a stage to make us be we call in an artist so there's so many values and there's no sense of support that i think is adequate for arts and culture in the country um we talk about culture so you see but it is everything about us we start here how we have cultural violence we start here we have cultural corruption we start here so many things that paints everybody with her much and that is what culture does and if we pay attention to culture and we start looking with respect to supporting artistic expressions and supporting um supporting cultural expressions we can move society in direction we want to see what the fact we need to but it has to be with a sense of arts and culture you know and of course we need even into that with tourism even into that with community development even into that with health even into that with education even into that everything feeds us in that integration yeah you know and that that whole sense of a single place where all the ministries come to is the way forward has to be the way forward and that's some kind of thing that's how I see it that's how I see it um when it comes to some company and feature um do you think in what is being done in the past or the recent parents in secondary school can talk about that well the sense of community there is a take arts program for secondary schools that's good news that's good news we need to get on board with that from free school you know because what, what it does too it helps with a sense of step and there there in the, 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 the engine that will drive people once I understand myself and understand where I am in society yeah I can make a contribution later. but teaching is made easy using theater as a tool everything is made easy using theater as a tool if we want to change uh culture like if a company buys out another one and they want to get an unborn person we must really get the people because we are the people the cultural local we are the people who could help you understand that this is who you are and this is what they're going to become and it is something that I have been involved in for a long time in change management in the front of companies, um, the action management in the front companies, and um, working with the front culture. So, education to come back to, to the, the question, you know, I've said all that thing. Education is made better using arts and culture. And if I want to talk arts and culture, it's, it's a broad thing, it's music. So that's what we need to do about better that mathematics and science. It's a different way to It's really do it. It's all there. And when we use arts and culture in, in schools from from jump, from as early as we can, and have it full there and have programs full there. So when we have sport, these are the things that help people do better academically. And it is the basket that will catch those who are not academically inclined because they now have another way to express themselves. And as such, they will be less deviant in classrooms, less disruptive in classrooms because they have their place where they excel and where they, where they have to learn their directions too. Right. So I want to I really appreciate Wood Arrows and, and Lord Lawrence's um, contribution. Great, great to start. Right, but I want to bring it back down to the communities. So I want to bring in both Chantal and Russell, right? People who walk the ground for you know for local government. I know you walk the ground and the, and the stars and the water and everything for local government, right? Tell us a bit of it. Yeah, that's right. And so I want you to tell us about 
what what you could have you what? right i've met i've been through it all the you know we want to be seen and you can be on the ground i love to share that because a lot of people you know five and a half hour budget i mean i i think anybody that realistically do anything for five and a half hours so how we contact them and right so, so tell us about what your experience about how that was received. Now you'll get to the other uh, stuff about you know, your expertise and what and that kind of stuff, right? But I want to tell us about how that was received on the market. Okay, it was then really late to have the market. We had to one to the NPA and one to people, and it's such a pleasure to be about it. But I don't know if you're a politician or anything. I think we are real people. We are in touch with society. <clears throat> we interact daily. We understand then that communities, people and girls, have been left out. Mm -hmm. uh, our communities have been totally ignored by this country. And when I look at it, there were three items which were the various and cultural programs. Um, and there was that period of the tax negotiation in our education. Now, after five months, what have you really done for the community? How have you really affected the community? Now, the community that I've been in, it's totally connected. I'm talking about it, and I really think we have a group that neglect totally roads, gradients, pavements. Uh, community centers, tools. I mean, you have to build the communities. Uh, they depend on community centers. I mean, mm -hmm. they can't just pick up a child away. I mean, they look forward to the community centers. And a lot of times, that is the only area I would keep them for community building and, and, and get together and so on. Even football fields are in a mess. You know, the stands, nobody will go there. So, what I've seen is we have totally lost it, this budget. And then again, I was looking forward for a home for the homeless and mm -hmm. a feeding program. And this government, I mean, has made the homeless homeless. I mean, and it's annoying me. There was a, a, a place in Forest State not too long ago, it's a car where the homeless people live in a car park. Mm -hmm. They closed that down. Right, so this is the one that you want to best. You need to come So, what I'm saying is the community is not to the new place. We could say, Go leave the school, we walk from the action, we walk all over the school in the back. I'm talking to you, 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 I'm a party that puts people to it will receive a positive ruling on the country. Mm -hmm. So, empower the people, focus on the people who are, and you will see great things in the world. So, for instance, I would like to see focus on community jobs and so on. But not only that, why can't we have on the job training, on jobs, mm -hmm. and certification program at the end? Of that job, wherever they keep going with the job and so on. How do we get people from level one to level two? Is it the same old, same old, you go and do uh, four hours of work and so on? And how do you improve and how do you change that? So the NTA is more focused on teaching development programs that focus on developing economies, developing areas. Um, I mean, for instance, we have to go and get down to the Oh, and these kids will have this little tool. So I can put my own little tool to be in 2020, 2023. They don't understand. A lot of us don't understand that technology that can be in that lab. Each person will have to go and go shoot with their new tool. You can get out of one with the connection. They have a lot of people. We also, I think we have here, the governments have here, so we have to keep up people. And the community is starting to go in and change that to make people out there from people. So there's no focus on that. Chantal, you want to tell us about the the role and 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 the 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 and the
women's empowerment perspective. Because that word empowerment is a such a important and powerful word. So I have reviews on a kind of daily basis. You know, I I I told you know members that we talk about how we idea that politicians are interested in power, the states are interested in power. And when I say state, we're not the same thing going in that. Right, and so you know, uh, non gender too. Tell us about that. Tell us about what women looking forward to the budget, what looking forward to an end game of the end game of it, and why, you know, what, what are your what is your wish list? Yeah, but it is the reality of what it is. I can't, if I, I can't afford to 
Director of Communications for the NTA. And if you missed the first half, our oh, Lord have mercy on the South. We saw in a world peace, Gaza, help, Errol G. Willie, the um, the Logos Boring, or you'll be able to be the uh, Hurricane in Florida. It was, it was the best half hour ever. Sorry, all missing. But anyhow, so we are back, and this is the NTA live on Wednesday, the 9th of October. Right, we're discussing budget and we're discussing NTA and how NTA is going to be pushing forward. Right. Um, so I want to kind of a little bit of a recap. We started off talking to um well, first of all, let me introduce everybody. This is Lauren Pouchet, our one of our deputy political leaders. On my right is my focus for the first hour, Marcus Scott, who's our um, director of new progression. My left here is Ziman himself, Chan Liman, Russell Chan, former LG candidate and present custodian, constituent custodian for Lego Martin Central. This gentleman, I think you all might know him a little bit. This is Aaron Fabian, another consistency custodian, Lord. Let me run up back when Lord. Um, for point 14, and finally, this beautiful young lady on the extreme left is Chantal Alexander. She's also a former LG candidate, and she is our uh, director of women's empowerment. Right, so here we go. Lauren, um, I want to recap some of the things that we would have would have would have spoken about. So tell us about your um, you know, we we would have seen the budget. We would have seen the allocations for um for the tourism as a whole and we would have seen your release well i would have seen your release on on the maritime industry and we will be out tomorrow by the way as part of a, a, a new format and letter that the NCO will be putting out give us a little recap 
um, about that later. I don't know what you're doing, but I can't think of you. I haven't made anything for that. The only thing I knew is not to resent that stuff, like everybody who does a focus on it, because of the amount, was the 54 million allocated on the city land to the which is waiting money. Because on the side of the island, that is not sea glass, it's matching it up, and it will continue to match it up. Okay, so that is a waste of $54 million that could go in many different pieces. I think that I didn't hear also anything about if we really promoting that they go for tourism and for the services sector. I really didn't see any emphasis based on that. Because you have to look at when you have services, you have to make sure you have to choose your services are both certified and then take the standards that are required. Now, we need to ban them at our standards, at standards that we want to have. But we have to have international standards if we want to bring people here. Okay? The whole maritime issue. That, the Yorkies, for example, they come down to Trinidad year after year after year because of the fact that they cannot be in the open seas because this is a hurricane. Um, in the hurricane season, they cannot be in the open seas. They don't get insurance. So they come to Trinidad, they come into port. They utilize all our people and all our services to help them because their boat is their home. So they need to fix their home. They need to buy food. They need to go for their manicure, their pedicure. They need to go to the doctor. They use all the services that we have here, but we don't make it easy for them. Because, for example, I spoke of the red tape when they come into immigration with their boats, they have horrors to get in here, horrors to stay here. Many of them have to go out and come back in, go out and come back in. That shouldn't be so. If we see this as a lucrative um, way of earning income for our people and U.S. dollars too, because they spend U.S. dollars, we should be making it easier for them to be here and not harder. They're all going to be given Grenada all the business. You know, we give in Grenada well, all the business. Well, that's an excellent point because in, in the release that you all will see tomorrow, you made the point about, you know, the situation when, when we had Beryl. Yeah. Everybody ran. They ran. To here. Yeah. I mean, right outside right there. there. You know, where I live, you know. It was hundreds. All by yeah. on the foreshore there. Yeah. Those boats lined yeah. up there like if it was, you know. Yeah. Because the other islands, Grenada doesn't have the capacity. They didn't have the capacity, so people would have to come here too. Okay, so, and, and we're not forward thinking. We don't look at the larger picture. And I think what was lacking in that budget, to be quite frank, I did not see that the budget had a vision for where they want to see Trinidad and Tobago. It didn't have a vision because you, you can't change everything in a year, but you can certainly put the groundwork. And all that, the reiteration, the rehashing of the last nine years by the minister, all that showed me was that we really haven't done anything. And that is why we are in a mess and the morass that we are in right now. So I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to put you on the spot. You're putting me on the spot? I'm putting you on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot. No problem. I'm back, Go well, ahead. Here, well, here what is the question? <laughs> you keep asking us. Mm -hmm. You keep asking me. Well, what do you until we do? What the NTA would do, yeah. we would have collaboration with the stakeholders. We would be talking to the practitioners, the people who are actually on the ground, the people who know what the visitors want, the people who know what people need. That's what we will be doing. We wouldn't be sitting down in an ivory tower and saying, well, okay, this is looking good. I'll put so much there. I'll put so much there. You see, the services sector, which is what I'm here to speak about, is not only about tourism, for example, or the maritime thing. It's about the barbers. Yeah. It's about the dressmakers. It's about the restaurants. It's about the hotels front staff, front, front desk staff. It's about any and everybody who could produce a service. But for you to do the service of a quality, you need to have standards and certification. For example, if somebody walks off, the cruise ships come. And that's another part, that's another place that a lot of services can happen because they need fueling, they need food. We're not even growing our agriculture. Don't start me on that. That's another thing. Because when these ships come into port, they're looking to get food to put back to go to the next port. Okay? We don't do any of those things because we don't have a vision and we don't collaborate. So the NTA's difference would be that we'll be talking to the stakeholders. We'll be talking to the people who make the things happen. Because it's not the government who makes the thing happen. It's you and me. We are the ones who make it happen.
We are the ones who create the experience. And I know Errol is going to talk about his culture and so on. And culture and art is part of the experience. And we are a people, we are loving, nice people. But when, <laughs> when water, modern flower, as they say, we're not so nice because if we can't eat and we can't feed each other, we're not so nice. So it's, it's problems, you know. So I, I think that what NTA will do probably is just make sure that we understand the needs of the people and craft our responses and our, our methodologies and everything to include them. Because that's important. But when you, men you, you mentioned something before when you were solving world peace, right? Oh, I was. About, uh, <laughs> <laughs> about the concept of how the, the approach, building it from the, 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 the family. Families, okay, yes. Building it up straight up until yeah. you understand that that's really where the strength Right. Now, let I me mean, tell you something. We spoke about building it from families. If the family system is okay, the community will be okay. If the community is okay, the city or the town that you're in will be okay. And if that's okay, then your country will be okay. But we're not doing that. And it does not start from just preschool. It starts from when the woman is pregnant and carrying that child, right. how she is treated, because that unborn fetus is going to respond to her stresses and her anxiety. It messes up the way the brain is wired. And if it messes up the way the brain is wired, we have a set of people outside there who dyslexic, ADD, or have issues, and we don't pick it up in time. And as we go through the as we go through the various stages, we start to see the behaviors changing and we don't understand it. So we have to make sure that things are in place for families. Healthcare is available. Um, the community, well, you we talk about the communities, but communities need to work together and to be together. Sorry, communities no, are not together anymore. They, everybody fighting on everybody. Sorry, I want to solve, mm -hmm. we are solving the other problems, right? Um, yeah. So um, what was it? Was wool hunger? Was it one that we solved? Yeah. yeah. Right. So I want to, agriculture now. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. So I want I want to <laughs> bring in before we get into Aaron because I know Aaron has a lot to say and with, with you know synergies mm. with what we talked about here. I want to go back to Chantal and 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 Russell, who were both local government candidates. They were they walked the ground. They saw that that energy. They they understand things. And Chantal, as our director of women's empowerment, you know. Talk to me about what, what Lauren said. I mean, I know there was a an incident yeah. that recently occurred close to where you live. And, yeah. you know, how does that affect the community? How does it affect you? How does it affect, you know, your your, your son, your children? And and tell us about that, you know, your wish list for, for, um, for women as far as the budget and as far as the NT is concerned. Okay. Um, in terms of crime in my community, it's that it was a really sad situation to know that crime could reach like it was actually a preschool. So yeah, to see where crime has reached. I know we know where it has reached, but I mean it was actually a woman dropping a child to school and that was the situation. Um my wish list as a woman empowerment, I would like to see more for women. Like battered women. We have so much ab abused women in Trinidad who don't have no way to turn. They have no way to turn. They have no way to speak to. These are things that we need. We need forums to open up. We need apps. Like, oh, we had this TTPS app. It was so easy. The gender-based violence app. It was so easy just to click a button on your phone and report these things. And you report it. You go in and had, it actually had counselors you could go to even though. So even though you report a crime, it had people who still used to counsel it there. The gender-based unit also had, they had counselors there also. So after that, you go through the whole phase, they had counselors. These things need to be accessible. And the thing is why it would close down an app and a unit like that. So I think these are things, this is my wish list is to see more for women and children. Like home for battered women, make it easier and more accessible make that a household name so women could know okay i'm going through a, a domestic violence it's easy to leave because some women would say okay i don't want to leave because i have no way to go these are homes we need to have it like just like how we have all these big government buildings not doing anything this is where we need to put these structures in we need to make it more accessible and easier so that is my wish list all right, so Mr. Chan, um, I have a question for you here. <laughs> um, in regards to the budget, right, what are some of the things you would have liked to see 
um in regards to community based projects um yeah community based projects well on my uh, last election crusade <laughs> um what i've seen is just total neglect okay so it's like when you go into some communities it's like back 20 or 30 years ago so over the years at 60 billion dollar budgets nothing has really changed which is amazing so the, what i want to see i want to see us get into the communities i want to see a difference and you know what i want to see too i want to see a 60 billion dollar budget at the end we return some of that money so i think we have gotten a habit of it's a 60 billion dollar budget we spend all let us put back some money and put it to good use and manage our money you know a lot of the communities are just run down pavements are just i mean we fixed a lot of pavements we fix water leaks and we did it quickly at low cost so when i spoke to people in the communities they said that water leak has been there for 15 years in fact the person told me that's how they know water on the line spraying all over for 15 years okay so we did a lot and here did a lot we fixed a lot of leaks and we gave the people in the communities to fix the leaks and to fix the pavements so i really think under a new administration we will focus on the people and i always say if you build the people you build a nation yeah. so for business for big business now if your population does well won't they spend and support business when they support the parlor when they support the shops when they buy uh, washing machines when they repair their homes i mean when you look at this budget there was three items one for wage negotiations there was a village and housing program for 150 000. now come on why do we treat our people like that what could you build for 150 000 really for a family now i see the minister increased by fifty thousand, but uh, material steel everything went way up now where can you re why do we treat our people like that and then we have 60 billion dollar budget you still can't get a, a bed in the hospital 24 hours to get a bed in the hospital it's not which something is wrong tim and um we have to stop we have to put an end to this and focus on our people and I'll just stick in one thing here, because when I was walking around a lot in the communities, there are a lot of people, a lot of young people, they're just standing around looking for something to do, looking for a program, somebody to put them in a program. So listen, um, I would say, okay, you're going to want to tell this guy or this group of guys, you have to go and train. Where are we going to train? Oh, it's up the highway um, by UE or something. How people with no money going to get in a car and spend a whole day or a month or six months doing a program, which they can't buy lunch, they can't get there. It doesn't make sense. So what I suggest we do, we have community programs, just like how we fix the pavements, just like how we fix the leaks, just like how we fix the drains. And we empower these people on the job training in the communities and certification at the end of it on the job in your community. So when you get that certificate, obviously, you will see Mr. Brown has completed building of the community school center. He has worked on the paper. This is his certificate now. And there he could launch off of that now and say, look, I did this. And then you could ask him do you have a nis number do you have a bank account do you and you train people to have a bank account and that is how you change lives in the communities and you build people so that is what i would say and that's just one little aspect of what i saw but what i've seen is total neglect 30 years ago you were with me we yeah, walked, we walked and we were amazed like nothing has changed in 30 years at 60 billion dollar budgets you know and if let us look at returning some of that money i agree and the budgets you know i want to add something to yeah that. i want to add something to that russell because what you're saying is so important because when i work on something in my community i take pride in it yeah. 
I don't want nobody to go and, and match. Or you put your foot on the wall, but take your foot off the wall, you know? Yeah. Because we build that. That's our wall. Yeah. We take pride in our community. And, and I'm, I'm saying that is a, another takeaway from the projects you're proposing to sure. do with the training within the community. So I, I want to mention something to the audience, right? When, and I, I, I'm going to plug my, my, my political leader, he's probably going to be embarrassed by me saying this, but when he was at, at um, he was commissioner, he was able to cut expenditure and redirect that money Bad into money. into different new value for money. Sorry. I mean, it was hundreds of millions of dollars he was able to cut in wastage, and we see uh, as as both you guys said yesterday, we see budgets come every year, and we you know it's it's just higher and higher and more and more. And at some point in time, we are going to, it's going to break, it's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So, so part of what ENT has, has, has really, really engineered is what Lauren talked about, what Russell talked about, that people focus building from the bottom up, but also that integrated integration of, 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 of ministries and, and, and stuff, which you're going to get to, I'm going to ask you about, about your, your release, right? But beyond that, I have seen a, a real commitment to doing it, to, to being solution oriented. Doesn't matter the cost. So when I say it doesn't matter the cost, you know, we will figure it out. We will, we will try to, to, to make it as, as simple as possible. Right. Ah. <laughs> I'd just like to add, Tim. I estimate there's a leak in Maraval on the main road. It's been leaking for the past seven years. Mm. Everybody sees it. Everybody part. It's at eye level, right? It's by the bridge opposite. Uh, How many ministers live in that area? Well, very important <laughs> people. And it's spraying now, so it's into car wash. So, what I don't understand, now I check it. I, I spoke to a friend of mine and he, he calculated how much to produce yeah. a gallon of water. And Tim, when I worked it out, every community may have 20 leaks or 30 leaks. And when I worked it out, I was into the billions of dollars in wastage of water every year. You know? So why are we not addressing that? Why are we not addressing other problems, other situations that can stop the wastage? And right. that money could be used to develop. to develop other things. And one more thing, yeah. the, 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 what I'm saying is we don't need all this set of billions of dollars every year and we don't see the value and the benefits because it's the same old norm. The, the budget is 60 billion every year and then nothing comes back. We have to break that. We have to transform that. No we have to transform that. Earl, so... Russell will identify billions of dollars in waste. Yes. Just, just from his own calculations, from his, his engineer um, um, friend's calculations. I want to say... Tell me about it. About I it. want to say <laughs> that um, that is so. And we have to face some realities. Okay? So maybe, just maybe, Wasa is a great harvester of water, but maybe not a good distributor. Maybe distribution needs to go to the corporation level. I don't know. But we have to take a good, hard look at ourselves, an honest look at ourselves, you know, and, and not give somebody a task that they're going to fail at, but try to give them a task that they can successfully do. But, uh, so, but I, I wanted to, to talk about the concept now of the remarkable the budget, mm -hmm. about arts and culture, right? And what was the allocations... You know, uh, we mentioned those two, two or three billion dollars that have been wasted. What the arts and culture would have cult culture would have been able to do with that era? With what? With what money? <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, seriously, okay. So I feel as though there needs to be the word development when talking about a lot of the things in Trinidad and Tobago, but absolutely arts and culture, because in spite of being treated like an outside child, I'll have to say. We fine. So people say we have no film industry. People say that. But if you look at the thousands of videos being produced by young people that going onto social media. 
I mean, we have something there that we need to harness. We need to try to find a platform for these people to put their work where it will be available globally, where people could identify talent and hire talent. And our young people could stay right here, be seen, get work, and they're still right here. And that is foreign exchange coming. But there's no sense of value placed to what is being done. And, or, or, or not enough for sense of value because you, you're talking about us needing to get more money and we think in tax is the way to do it, but we all know you can't tax your way out of uh, economic situation. Uh, yeah. So let's examine where this is. Because these guys, if we take the, to call a couple names, the certified Samson, the, um, the hilarious big eye boy. Kyle Boss, Kyle Boss, um, <laughs> Daniel Lovelace, all these people, and and just a few. I mean, and it's endless, it's endless, it's endless of them making these TikTok videos and so on. But that is video production. Kevin, Kevin, Sawyer, Sawyer, Kevin, you know, Kevin Sarah, you know. Kevin Saran, yes. It's, it's, these are video productions and there's value. These people, this is an energy and a capacity that we can harness. And in, and in, in a film industry, we can harness and put to good use. I was on the film board at one point in time. So was that. And a minister of government had a problem with a film that was done in Trinidad, Girlfriends Get Away, where there was a, a, a marijuana dealer in it, you know, and, and frowning upon the government supporting such a film because it makes the country look bad. And, and I don't get that because that's a very narrow view. Because if you look at Swamp Dog Millionaire, which saw the worst of the worst of the slums, so to speak, in India, that what that film did, that single film did for India in terms of revenue and visibility and opportunity and so on is phenomenal. So it's, again, putting the right people, not giving people tasks that they're going to fail at, but finding the right people to place in positions so that development can happen. And that is the thing. That development is the, the nucleus of transformation. And that is what we have to look at. There are a number of things that we could fix in this country, you know. But fixing suggests that it's going to work how it used to work. Mm -hmm. But we don't want that. We need to transform our country, transform the society. There's a new way. Some people like how it was back in the 60s or the 70s. And yeah, it was good, but that's not good for 2050. Yes. There's a new day ahead. There's a new way ahead. There's a new approach and to find that we have to work together all sectors have to work together but more than that the nta in its way forward is looking at a central platform for ministries to converge and that is where the savings they're talking about redirecting hundreds of millions that'll be redirecting billions of dollars because Everybody can operate in a silo and take us successfully transformed forward. Integrated and strategic. Integrated and strategic. You know, so much is happening in the world today with AI, Tim. And I know you on the forefront of that kind of thing, you know. And, yeah. and we have not placed the, the, the programs into the schools, our young people, that, that is their thing. They're born to do that. And we have not placed the programs in there. We haven't placed the opportunities in there. We haven't placed the platforms for them. And we really need to look at that because arts and culture being integrated into all of our ministries is going to help the transformation we want to see. I just want to cut in and say something. We're talking about the budget, so let us get back to basics. We elect people to run our business. Just like in a family, whoever is working handles the finances. Right. Not so? But they handle the finances based on the needs of the community, of the family. Mm -hmm. I don't see the people that we have elected for the past nine years running the budget of the country like that. We take care of the necessities, but we must we in our families, for example, in our family, we make sure we have food, we have shelter, the children can go to school, we have transportation, but we know that we're working hard for this money. So we're not going to waste this money. 
And we're going to try to have at the end of the month a little more money so that we can put it aside. But you see, what is happening, the people that we elect, the politicians, are operating with our money as if it is their money. And they can do what they want with. Because what I did not hear at all in the budget was any kind of justification or accounting for how they spent last year's money. Mm. And that has always been the problem with our budgets. We never hear what has been the results of the spend of your taxpayers' money and my taxpayers' money. Lorraine, I want to say, I do not believe no part of me believes that the people who uh, run in this country now, the government, wants to see and wake up and calculate ways to make people suffer. I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that they consciously sit down and work out how we could make them suffer some more. I know you are also. I know what you say in the opposite of what you're already being. But, well, I believe that, <laughs> but I believe they just have a job that they are incapable of the totally thing. incapable and because you know what they don't value the money because the money they think the money is given to them to just do what they want with it they don't know how hard we have to work to be able to generate that money in the first place apart from the gas and oil so they may not deliberately want to do certain things but, but they're incapable in, totally they don't have a vision incapable. but nta has a vision they don't have the vision but we have it Right, guys, so we have come to the first session of our of post budget. Yes, of our post budget. Um, anyone would like to leave any last comments? Well, I would like to thank you, you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And listen, um, people of Trinidad and Tobago, we are at a serious situation in our country. I mean, I shouldn't have to tell anybody that. We know it. The people of Trinidad and Tobago know where we are. And we cannot continue like this. This is a government that simply, to me, doesn't care. Because as I said earlier, this government made the homeless people homeless. The car park in Port of Spain was closed down and put the people on the street. I mean, where do, I mean what madness is that? So, again, coming back to every year with the budgets, we waste, in my opinion, over $10 billion a year in wastage. Bad management. You, you pave roads, it don't last. You fix bridges, it don't last. Water leaks, seven, ten years. I could take you and show you water leaks for seven, ten years. When you add up the cost of that, you have... 20 billion, 15 billion a year in wastage. You do not need to tax people more. Cut the wastage and follow the lamp model, right, of the NT. And my last okay. comments will take off on that because in the lamp model, the A stands for accountability, which is return on investment. And this is why I made that point a couple of minutes ago that I did not hear anything about accounting for how we spend the money. And I'm only hearing blanket things about what is going forward. We need to be, as an NTA government or part of the government, we will make sure that there's accountability and that money is put in the places that it is needs to put to empower our people and to build and develop our people. Gotcha. Mr. Fabian, anything from you? Well, I'm looking forward to the next session because I'm staying um, to meet with June and Savita and them to find out so much more. Oh, yeah, that's our that's deep. Deep. yeah, to meet and to find out and delve a little further into what are the possibilities for us as a nation going forward. Yes, yeah, so I'll be here. Chantal? Have any... Um, my last words as we as we spoke about well as my colleague they spoke about everything um last thing i want to touch on as a people of trinidad and tobago watch your roads watch your drainings for the past years watch how our country has been from up to down and i just want to say put country first and put party last Right, so we are going to be taking a little break now. And when we back, when we come back, we're gonna have a new host.
couple of hosts in surface here looking all resplendent <laughs> right and uh, a crew of ladies as well will be joining uh, joining them so welcome back my friends um this is another session in the same session, part two, so to speak, of our discussion with our team members here at the National Transformation Alliance, looking at the budget. And we can all look at the budget and take a pin and chuck a thousand holes in it. What is very important for us as a people is looking at the way forward. And that is what we are charged with as members of the National Transformation Alliance, by our political leader and our governance team. So, Insaf, how are you doing? I am good. Mr. Fabian, how are you, sir? <laughs> Mr. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're doing good. And um, joining us this afternoon, well, Insaf is our co-moderator this afternoon for this part of the session. Next to Insaf is Paul. Do you need the Mr. Andy Nahos and all this thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, that's good. And that's good. Paul is an alderman at the Diego Martin Borough Corporation. Borough Corporation. Yeah. Um, next to Paul is Nicoline Chinchami Taylor Nicoline was a candidate in the local government election and she is the constituency custodian for Lopine Bonnet West. Next to Nicoline is Joan Byrne. How are you, Joan? Just right. We know you don't have a mic yet, right? So, Joan, wow. How do we describe Joan? A woman of class. Yeah. She, intelligent. She pretty much heads up the legal perspective of things here in the NTA because that's her background. Joan is an accomplished lawyer. And she but she has a different portfolio of than legal here with the NTA. Good evening, uh Errol and our viewers. And yes, I am the director of legal uh, on the National Transformation Alliance yes, gov perfect. governance team. Right. And next to Joan, we have Savita, who is our education person. And your correct um, portfolio is Director Education Services? Yes, correct. So I am Savita Pei. Nice to be here this evening. Should Good see? evening to our viewers. You see, I know the people. Right. So we want to jump right into the discussion. And I'm going to start with you, Savita. Because, Savita, you've been on the ground doing um, community work and looking specifically at education. Tell me how you felt about what the budget had to say for education, had to offer to education, and how you see our needs now in that area. Well, then looking at this budget, right, I sort of was disappointed at certain allocations that was given within the Ministry of Education. Reason being, when you look at the finances allocated towards academic low performance as opposed to allocations located to renovating UE, right? Um, you would wonder why is it our ministry choose to focus on allocating more finances towards creating production in ebook, in historical ebook, right? You would wonder why would you allocate uh, higher funding towards that as compared to our low performance low performance in academics right now when you look at academics and you look within the last year how our students have been performing you would realize they have been a decline in the performance within our education system so i actually thought that our minister would have focused on allocating more funding towards you know doing research looking at the challenges that students are facing and why is it that we are getting a low results in terms of performance Tell me a little more. Um, I don't want to move away from you yet, Savita. What have you been seeing on the ground with respect to education and what applies? Well, I personally think that we need to invest in assessments. What is currently taking place within our education system? No assessments are being done on these children. So more or less, we throw children into a classroom environment who learns differently and expect everybody to cope 
at the same pace and also using the same type of learning that cannot work you know because we have learners that might be musically inclined kinesthetically inclined we have all different types of learners within one classroom and environment so i believe that we need to put some focus on assessing these children understanding what are their needs how they learn and not you know we're in a classroom leaving them behind we cannot afford to leave these children behind a lot needs to be done in terms of teacher training to be able to assess these children and understand how these children intake information to be able to help these children excel thank you savita um I, so i would like to draw you at my attention now to mr paul naus who is here to discuss national security and um and we know the hot topic right now one of one of the hot topic right now um is um crime mm -hmm. within the ministry of uh, national security, or security of course and a lot of people is being affected by crime and looking at a document i have in front of me here for national security there was a location of 6.1 billion dollars mm -hmm. allocated for crime now i'm not too sure about the figure that was allocated last year Mm -hmm. But what do you think about the monies that have been spent behind national security and where we are right now when it comes to crime and the, how it's affecting the people of China and Tobago? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that looking at it and going over the documentation fit and so on, the allocation is a fair allocation. Uh, the issue is really allocation. People would say that, you know, we have a thing in Trinidad, we like to say, well, spend more on this, spend more on that. That doesn't equate to performance. So the allocation was adequate. Um, I saw the several things, several areas were addressed, CTDF, TTPS, um, you know, of course, the main areas. The issue I really have is um, people would say that, all right, increase the budget, just put more money, and you can't put a, life, a price on life. Right, and that is the main argument for spending more with policing, not and actually policing fire all these services worldwide. That's always the argument. You can't put a price on life. However, the reality is that you that resources are finite, and you have to balance the books. There's a lot of wastage that goes on in all ministries, but national security as well. And I think criminally fact of that would help a lot, and it will go a lot further. Like for example, a lot was allocated to new assets. Now we know new assets are important. Modern technology is important. However, I'm not sure a proper needs-based assessment was done to determine that before going into this thing of purchasing vehicles, boats, and so on. What they need to do is revitalize, um, revive, and basically do a facelift on a lot of the old equipment. That you'll, you'll find that you're spending um, a fifth of the cost in some areas if you look to bring older vehicles up to spec rather than purchasing newer vehicles and purchasing quantities for, this goes for vehicles, this goes for boats, where basically the book value will be reduced to zero before you even use it because of the excess. So remember something, when you buy assets as well, any assets you purchase, they have to store somewhere. They have to be maintained. There's a cost to everything. And some is a recurring cost. And what we look at in national security budget, as with a lot of ministries, the recurring cost is the majority of the budget. Um, and salaries, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's around $2.5 billion a year in salaries. As a sound, actually salaries went, there are less salaries to pay this year than, um, or less to on salaries than last year. So when we're looking at it, we have to look at it from a holistic um, perspective of where does that money go? Is it enough on how to trim the fat? As a matter of fact, you can reduce the budget in national security and get more performance if you do a proper needs-based assessment and you really look at how to intelligently spend that money to get the best bang for your buck. Well, let's go a little deeper. Um, let's talk a bit about maintenance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know when our political leader was the commissioner of police, he would have mm -hmm. used um, some monies to bring back, let me say, bring back the vehicles that mm -hmm. was in the dead yard, right? Now, right now, we have a big problem in this country where for community policing, mm -hmm. when it comes to vehicles patrolling the areas and things like that, did the budget talk about anything about bringing vehicles or rehabilitating vehicles to enhance the community policing area uh making that there i didn't see that direct link they were talk they were talking about um increasing increasing municipal police presence um i i push aside stuff about recruiting police officers in the batches of um a thousand a year rather than 300 because logistically that is not possible right now so maybe that was talk maybe there were plans for that but not necessary again because the problem is not manpower the problem is management um, in terms of 
I, I think the, there's a lot of police vehicles. We know about police graveyards with vehicles. Um, some you really just have to scrap. Some you really just have to say, you know what, just for parcel, do for parcel, whatever you can, because uh, it, it's it's not worth these. The juice is not really squeezed to bring them back. Those that can be brought back, um, along with new new assets purchased, I think that they can a lot can be lent um, to municipal police to pre and the, You know, I, I think that the TTPS and it, they do they do assist um, the other police agencies such as municipal, such as pre and because those are police officers. But I think that a lot more collaboration could happen. A lot more can be done to bolster the forces of municipal police of the pre and squad. And those are, just like, those are the main examples. But they need to be feeding off each other. Because the municipal police have a job, and they have a very specific role according to the Municipal Corporations Act in terms of their type of policing. There were talks recently about having um, a municipal police task force and doing these type of things, and I really thought, I, I, at first I was like, you know, okay, great idea, just because I'm looking at more crime reduction, but then you're creating more redundant rules. So I think it's important for each arm to know exactly what their role is, and to do that with the support of the others, and have overlapping only when necessary. That will help to cut down that redundancy. Because redundancy also too has not been producing um, positive results. You have reached emission returns very quickly with those agencies. Well, management really is the issue then. Entirely, entirely. Management is the issue. Um, and as, as basic as getting the same types of vehicles now, because in policing vehicles will take a lot of licks. Yeah, they take a lot of licks. So don't, you know, people see the vehicles look around. On that they point. They take a lot of licks. Look, on that point. They take licks, but some people give too much licks. This is how they treat government this assets. And that, again, it's across the border government agencies, yes. how they treat the government assets. I don't think the standing orders to enforce um, that are strong enough. Uh, they need to go over that. But I, I do. if you don't mind, I want to really touch on something because sure. we're talking about policing. We'll talk mm-hmm. about policing. We'll talk about both. We'll talk about regiment. We'll talk about those things. But the, pe- the those that I like to refer to kind of tongue-in-cheek as the ambassador um, of national security, I want to see more for the fire service. Right. I, they have three out of how many, 13 fire, or how much ever fire stations, only three are fully equipped. equipped. I, there are fire officers running with rags around their face, wet rags in a burning building. I mean, that is, that is absurd. In terms of that, I would like to see more resources put towards fire services. I would like to see more resources put towards immigration, but not in, you know, they want to do the e-passports. All that is good. I agree with that. We need to move with the technology. However, I want to hear more about what you're doing to expand training for immigration officers. What you're doing to equip immigration officers to do the type of raid they need to do in immigration without perhaps heavy police enforcement or involvement in that you don't want too many leaks to come out with intel on. So in immigration, like for example, in the US, when you see ICE moves on something, ICE is moving. Yes, it will involve agencies, but ICE is the one leading charge Mm -hmm. for immigration matters. So in the same way, our immigration officers need to be leading the charge, but they could only do so if they equip properly, if they train properly, and they are given that mandate. So I want to, and even with prisons, I I want to see more put in the hands of the agencies that that are mandated to deal with these issues, not just, well, police taking care of everything, and these agencies just there for their support or their authority at the time. Well, there's an elephant in the room when we're talking about prisons. In, and I want to get your feedback or your feeling on prisoner transportation. Prisoner transportation can be done entirely by the state. Now, there's, there's, there's one caveat to that. So I'll have to, I'll have to say this. In terms of, we know there's a lot of corruption. We know there's a corruption issue with national security as a whole. And I'll say that without reservation. A private security agency gives another layer of, of um, protection. However, at the same time, you can use another, another aspect of national security, another agency from the state, to have that redundancy or to have that overlap of security. Mm-hmm. So that can that can be done at probably a very, 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 very reduced cost. I which you leave out a couple of varies. A few varies, a yeah. few varies. But yeah. and that, again, finite resources. That money could either reduce the national budget or it can go back into the prison system to improve it. Either way, a motor pool, a motor pool, either, either way, what it does now is you're going to, you can take that money, put in, have them run their own thing in prisons with it, have another agency and have leftover to reduce your, your national budget on that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I'm going to chat with Nicolene for a little bit now, who has been very active recently, um, trying to get things done in a heritage community that have been undone forever. Uh-huh. How do you feel about having to fight that fight, Nicolene? 
to be in a village as a little girl and to grow up there and to actually have to stand up with the people, I feel honored as one, but I feel we have been neglected for too long. And to know that used to be and what it has reached to, at least at this point, it's, it's very heartbreaking. Um, just on Monday, with the floods and stuff that the residents face in Aruka, I mean, yesterday when I went there, this one person alone lost over two hundred thousand dollars in 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 from their business. That's just one person. I mean, we're talking about the Eastern Main Road in Aruka, and then we're talking about over the bus route where we had water reaching at least three to four feet height going through wow. people's windows. So you. I continue to go to these people, and this is four years now, and from 2020 to now, Monday was the worst flooding ever since. And it's simple things that could be done, which is the drainage and maintenance. And I think not only in Opinion Bonnier West, but throughout Trinidad, that to be able. Maintenance is not being done where it comes to drainage. And then we have roads. Now, we're... We are situated, the rivers and, and streams, everything is mountain areas. The water crosses the road. So obviously it's going to damage at some point in time. So if you don't um, keep those things, I mean, eventually it's going to trickle down to the to, to persons who have their vehicles. That's one. And then we have the Lopino historical site. When we don't have access to these things, how are you going to say, well, going back to tourism, that's a main point of tourism. How are you going to use that? You understand? Then there are school children that there are villages beyond Lopino. There's Lapasura, there's the alley. And that's from the alley to Lopino. It's about 20 minutes drive. And with roads like these, it'll take longer than that. What our child has to get up from school to reach out to Aruka? Right? You're talking about five o'clock. A child has to leave home. This is primary school. School calls at least from quarter past eight. So it's unfair to persons, um, it's unfair to the villagers, and going back to the flooding, persons within from 2020 to now, ODPM has not reached out to them. How do you access the losses from people? How how do you go to them and try to say, well, all right, let me see how I could help you get back your refrigerator so for your business or for persons who have lost their beds. And then there are children in these homes as well. You may lose your school books, your, your food supplies, something. It's, it's really heartbreaking. And it's something that you don't want to be asking people over and over and over again and getting serious. No, I response. know you're on the ground. Yeah. And you tell me about the children, but I have a concern. I'd like to know if you have been in touch with the elders in the community who have been through this for decades. What is their emotional state with respect in to... In Aruka there, this? we have never, from since I'm a little child, I'm using from my perspective, we never, oh, yeah, oh. we never experienced, <laughs> we never experienced that type of flood and rain will fall, it will channel out and all the water will go where it's supposed to go. But recently developed buildings high up in the Pine Ridge area and then the water is not being able to channel through a properly big drainage. It's a small channel for a vast volume of water that could never work. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Wasa plant there where they build a wall. So if there's a big wall for the water, the water wouldn't be able to pass. It comes like a building, a, a big a big pool for us to, to, to enter. So it's not going to work and the people are crying out. There's no MP or council or anybody on the ground. They have said that they have tried to reach out. Um, no one has seen anyone. Up to this present week here, no one has saw their MP or their council. Briefly, briefly tell us, what is the way forward? Because yeah, this community is not unique with these issues. A number of communities have this sense of neglect that is happening. What What is the way forward, do you think? The way forward, I will believe, is the persons to stick to their jobs. You were put in positions to do something. And I don't think that we should have to cheer you on to do what we put you to do. Right? No one is supposed to clap and say, hey, you pave a road for us, you fix a, a drain for us. That is what our taxpaying dollars is put there to do. And keep with your promises. Do not only come in your strong PDs and ask 
or, or help those in those areas and then after come in the other PDs and ask for a vote. That is the only time you see people. You only see them when you're grown. And it's going to come soon. You haven't seen persons for the past week or two with all these floods. No one. But as that election bell ring, you're going to see everybody on the ground reaching out to the same people who has been crying out mercilessly. McLean, I have one question for you before I go to June, mm -hmm. right? And June, I have a few questions well, mm -hmm. so prepare yourself. <laughs> um, as a young, I don't want to say a young man or a young cop, Philly Agua, so <laughs> same question. When I now get my license, let me put it like that, right? Yeah. I said, Lima Lutton Lupino. That was my place, that was a getaway place. Mm -hmm. It was it's a place full of culture, a place, the, the people around me, like family. It's a feel like in a different part of Trinidad. Yeah. And recently, when I go in there, it's a bit different, right? Infrastructure wise, right? Now, the question I, I have, you don't need to answer it now. You can mm -hmm. answer it later on in anything, yeah, yeah. right? The MP for your area is in charge of utilities, yes? Yes, yes. How is the how is the water situation in in, in Lupino right now? Well, I could tell you. I will tell you from my point, my experience. When it rains, before he changed over that whole wasa plant, we could have still got water. If one little drop of water falls down from the sky, it's going to be locked off. So water is not accessible even during a slight shower of rain. We are talking about. The roads access as well. And he's there all the time in Lupino. We all we know that you are you are there frequently. You are seeing the conditions and you're not the, the issue for me is you're not reaching out to the people. You're not having conversations with persons on the ground. So you wouldn't know what are the issues. And even if we cry out and we say these are the issues and we publish it and we use social media, we use any form of media. It's still not adhering to us. So, so based on what you're saying, the waterman is not providing water when plenty of water is falling. That's yeah. what you're saying? Uh, okay, basically. <laughs> All right, June. How are you this evening? I'm great. Thank you. So I know you're here on a different capacity um, you have to talk a little bit about um, health. All right? And, yes. um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Errol, but um, I know some people around the world and even in China and Tobago, used to one day and uh, used to once consider our healthcare system in this country one of the best in the world. People is actually used to come here and try to get the free medical. And over the last few years, that has been deteriorating slowly but surely. Yeah. All right. Now I see here uh, again we have a, a nice little budget going on here, a nice little allocation for seven point five billion dollars. Yes, with the situation that we our healthcare uh, 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 we are in this uh, in this age twenty twenty four, what do you think about us? I think it's great. It's a great allocation. Figures sound no, the figures sound figures good. sound good, but it's really how is it going to be put into use? Is it going to filter down? to really help the people who use the system? Is it going to mean that people don't have to wait overnight sitting on a chair in accident and emergency at hospitals? I understand that Mount Hope recently, I think Nicolene was saying, people waiting to, to see a doctor and their, their relatives had to be sitting in the rain. Is that going to, to, to be the effect of this allocation? Are these, are these figures going to be used to assist the people, as I said, who utilize, who utilize the system? You know, are they, is it going to be used to hire more accident and emergency doctors? Is it going to be used to hire more nurses, more doctors to, to, to staff the hospital? And that actually is what we don't know. We don't know how the last allocation was used, as Lorraine was saying earlier. And we don't know what is going to happen with this allocation. But we do know that the suffering is going to continue. We don't see any alleviation of that in staff in the near future. Well, I know one of the, well, one of the main problems we have in most ministries, if not all ministries, is transparency. Yes. And right now, as a people, we, not, we are not sure where our money is going and how it's being spent. Our taxpayer tax 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 dollars, pay, dollars, yes. And we are not even seeing it. Exactly. Right? Now, you spoke just now about the hospitals being um, over capacity. 
Right. right. I saw an article, was it yesterday or, or day before yesterday, where was someone posted, I think Russell had posted on, on his social media, where people and Mount Hope were sitting in the corridor waiting for attention for about 24 hours. Yes. Now, my thing is, we have two major, major hospitals in China and Tobago. That's, well, three. We have, we have, we have, we have Mount Hope. San Fernando, yes, Mount Hope. But we have, we have, we have, we have, Kuba, you have the Kuba Hospital. We are, we are over, capacity, over capacity, but at the same time, we have a hospital that is sitting doing nothing. Yes. And all this money is being spent. You want to bring in this, you want to spend money behind there. But why, why are we not utilizing what we have? And what, what do you think about that? Well, I think, first of all, that the powers that be and the minister in charge is certainly he is out of touch with reality or he doesn't want to be in touch with reality for whatever reason. He is not really out there feeling the needs of the people. I read recently on the, on the papers that Mount Hope had no clean linen, you know, but yet we were able to see that he had been robbed of his jewelry, etc. That made the headline news, not the fact that there's no clean linen in a, in a major hospital in this country. So I think really and truly it's the powers that be and those who are in charge and in control of that ministry that they are not doing their jobs. No, that one minute. Um, uh, so the minister got robbed the other day, set it on a lineman on the corner, and he, you know, it was um, dealt with almost immediately. No one was charged. And uh, that made headline. That actually explode, exploded on social media. Yes, it did. But we had two incidents this year, I believe, where the Paulus Penn General Hospital became a war zone. First time in the history of China and Tobago. Yes. And that, to me, is, 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 is an embarrassment. And I want to know... Why, why don't we have proper security inside it? How come we can have people just driving in to the, the, the hospitals and just shooting up the place? Like well, well, in South, we have no proper security anywhere in this country, as you are well aware. We just, we are not safe in this, in this country. I have a sense from what you're saying and what I hear from Paul and Nicolina and Savita that efficiency seems to be a problem that we Definitely. need to make things efficient and I dare say that instead of closing Petrotrain we could have sought to make it efficient we could have sought Correct. to make Carony efficient mm -hmm. you know these things that serve us so well and could still have been saving us well and now here we are how are we going to make or how do you feel we can make efficiency a hallmark of how we operate as a nation in this country well i think that certainly there are people left in this country who want to see that happen who want to see change who want to see transformation and that is very that, that is this group of individuals here and our outreach uh members we want to see that transformation and we can make it happen errol yeah but how do you feel about efficiency in national security that that i think particular thing. i think i will pass that over to, to the expert so uh, and this is something that our political leader had seen in the police and when i was part of his team there that uh, a lot of what we were doing was trying to make things just more efficient I, it all starts with a need uh a need assessment right. it all starts with a need assessment what do we need um, then you go to a cost benefit analysis. You, that, like, you plan out. So before you start talking about management, you plan fit. We start talking about efficiency, you plan fit. And then it goes through a run. Then you'll find out, okay, well, it didn't, it, things in practice don't happen how you'd like from theory. Mm -hmm. Then you trim it down and it's a process. So efficiency is a product of a process. Right. And you just go over and over until you trim as much fat as possible and become as lean as possible. The problem is that national security I don't and this is something for a while now this is not with this government the last government this is something for a long time now national security I don't think has been operating efficiently from any aspect um, you have some areas such as prisons that is understaffed mm -hmm. what the second division prison officers have to go through in terms of the prison population versus the number of officers on shift people wonder well why they don't um, they're more aggressive with prisoners and they said that how can they be when it's one officer to 200 prisoners. Look at anywhere Dude, in the no. world that they have these things. There is a ratio in corrections. It works. Correct. There's a ratio and there's a safe range even if you're short of resources. So you'll have somewhere understaffed such as that and then you have somewhere, and this may be controversial, but the military is overstaffed. 
our military currently is overstaffed. And I'm not saying that it's people will jump and say, well, you need a military, we do need a military. We do, they have legitimate functions. However, we need to do assessment. Are we to recruit this many people a year to keep the attrition rate down, which is something you do as a matter of administration, keep the attrition rate down, keep the attrition rate down. But are we overstaffed in TTDF? Are there other areas now where possible candidates at TTDF can go into such as prisons. So when, when you see you have a lot of recruitment in one area, it takes away from other areas. You need to make sure that if someone wants a career now, maybe even setting up a type of um, guidance portal online in schools or so, because yes, they do fairs where TTDF come, TTPS will come into schools and so, but are they targeting certain individuals, certain schools? I went to see Mary's College and I always wonder why I didn't see TTPS come to recruit from there. And you know this whole stereotype, well, let's see, I see fellas or whatever. So, um, the former commissioner was a saints boy. Right. Right? So, you know, and I have friends from St. Mary's that went into certain public service areas, but why aren't they targeting everyone and specifically targeting, okay, we want to get, um, we, we want to get more recruitment for prisons. And that's one national security. Mm -hmm. Prisons, prisons send prisons to more places, send TCDF to less places to recruit. Right. You know, our, they, they must be tactics are determined strategy. by your strategy, not the other way around. And I think the major problem um, throughout all these services is a lot of times, and we see a lot with TTPS in particular, where ta the strategy is dictated by the tactics. So they have it upside down. Wrong, sir. And, and that's, where the, that's where the main problem lies, the strategic plan, and then following through with the system of um, executing it, then seeing how we could re, um, how you could trim the uh, for lack of better again trim the fat from it how we can make it more efficient if the process is efficient the result is not going to be efficient I have a sense that using digital platforms is definitely a way to make things more efficient I also have a sense that there's some hesitancy because it will expose things you know when something is there digitally it can be tracked um, you have to be um, accountable, you will be held accountable. I want to ask you, Kavita, how you feel about so Savita, forgive me. I want to ask you, Savita, how you feel about a digital platform um, being introduced into the education system that you figure can bolster efficiency and target some of the things you were talking about earlier that you reckon are needed? Well, I definitely would advocate for a digital introduction within our education system. You would realize the only thing that have not been evolving is our education system. So, and you wonder why our youths are being so not motivated to learn anymore. Because when you have access to technology on the outside, and then you come within a learning environment and you have to leave your phones off or you have to not be exposed to technology and just stand up and listen to a lecturer or a teacher speak to you. You're going to get bored because now these children are advancing faster than our school system is advancing. So, so technology is not being incorporated as far as, as our society is globally growing. So I would advocate for technology being introduced within our classroom environment. Then we look at children who are visual or visual learners. What takes place with these individuals within our classroom environment? They are left behind because now they have to listen to audio, which is, um, you know, listen to someone speak rather than actually interface with digital learning, where these individuals, if placed within a digital environment, will excel as compared to other children. So we need, like I said before, to assess our children to understand how they learn and put things in place in order to excel their type of learning. And I want to ask the same question about health. Because um, I've seen a lot of paper. Yes, I move. I, I go through this system often, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of paper and a lot of duplication of information. Can, can a digital platform help to bolster efficiency in health? Oh, definitely. I, it can, for, even for medical records and that kind of thing, that there's so much paper and so much bureaucracy in the system to apply for anything. You can't get an e-copy of anything from the Ministry of Health. You have to physically go and the old-time way and get copies and they have to pull a file, a paper file. And, you know, that is so archaic in, the modern, in the, these modern times. I mean, just to talk about something that is unrelated to this, but even at our airports, we are one of the only airports that I know in the world where you have to 
fill out that form, right? You fill it a, lo a long, tedious form. What do they do with it when you hand it into the customs officer? I see. I think they keep it in boxes until it's just garbage and they throw it out after a while. Why? Why are we tortured like that in this place? But it's the same as you coming back to health. We face it all the time. You simply, even in my profession, you can't get legal rec uh, medical records for cases. It's it's always a hassle red tape, bureaucracy, everything. Uh, I think Trinidad is listed on uh, one of the highest for difficulties to do business business yeah. with. And that was mentioned in the budget highlights. It it's, and it's, it's always difficult. And that's why we will never, I, I can't see us progressing, you know, into the next century. But transformation can help. Transformation that. will help, definitely. Will. But June, um, about a few years back, I think it's just before covid I um, traveled, can't remember where, I was coming to the airport, and I remember seeing those machines right here in Port right here in Pia, Yes, they were here. Where the, you, you walk up to this machine and they scan your face and your, your fingerprints, and I don't know. They have a very short lifespan. They disappeared. They disappeared. They stopped their use when COVID was happening. I see. And yeah, well, and well, and well, post COVID, well, they didn't come well, back. Out the, yeah. Out the mind, right? yeah, they didn't come back. My but, goodness. But the thing about it, and that is how we we don't take future, we don't think futuristic because if they stop it during COVID and they never brought it back, your places like Canada, and New York, every and other Cruise, country, they continue every to, other country in the world is using it. it. And, and, and Caribbean, Caribbean islands, Jamaica, Barbados have it. But my, my question is, where are these machines today and why, why they wasn't brought well, back and how much money was paid they were just to bring these machines back here? Yeah. But um, I just want to go outside outside of your um, your topic today. And I know you were, you were here to talk, you're here to talk about the health. But um, I just want to talk a little bit of finance, if that's okay. Yeah. And um, our Minister of Finance is talking about introducing... Um, something called the revenue authority which i believe is like our local irs or something like that right? yes yes um but together with that everything that comes out his mouth is tax this tax that and taxi dog and you know and he's now putting something in place where a body in place where he they will now come after you to make sure that they get their money. What do you think about that, that the uh, revenue authority that they've been right? Well, I think, as I said, everything in name sounds good and there are probably very good intentions behind it. Uh, the minister has said that if it is implemented properly, we, he will capture about $10 billion in taxes. That, uh, you know, there's a, a deficit at this point and he will manage to capture that $10 billion. The point is, I'm happy for that because if people, the people who evade taxes, I am happy for them to have to pay taxes. I pay my taxes, you know, and I can sleep at night. But there are many, there are millions of people who don't, right? Don't pay their taxes. And I think it's all, it's, it's all a good thing in name. It's a good idea, a good concept. But really and truly, if they do get that 10 billion, where is it going to go? What is the trickle down effect? Is it going to improve social services? Is it going to increase pension, pensions for old age people? Is it it's infrastructure, rural development? Is it going to, where, what, yeah, accountability, where is it going to go? It's all, it sounds very good. I'm happy for it if it works well. Now, you know, together with that, we have what we call the property tax that, that has been introduced yeah. right, and implemented. And again, all these things could be good if the money is going That's right. where it's supposed to go. That's right. Now, I've noticed there were a budget allocation in um, local government, and now they are collecting the money for, for property tax, oh, and yes. voters would be going in the same place. Now, I don't know if Paul would like to take this. Um, share, share a little of what you think about the property tax, and what do you think, and, and, and I want you to share with the public here the NTA view and what, our, what, we, will, what we will do with the taxpayer's dollar when we get our chance to be country. And to, to work I, I would prefer <laughs> to ask our director of finance, because uh, I have more money, but, but, but I, I'll try to answer. From, from a local government perspective, I'll answer you. So the intention of the tax is to eventually be collected by the local government corporations and spent on the local government matters. However, that part of the legislation has not yet been proclaimed. So remember that. It, the taxes go to the consolidated fund, and so now what we have is a promise that it will be spent on, on that. It's just a promise that what is gathered will be spent until those sections are proclaimed. And there's a management issue that as well that may come up. That will come up, I would say. So in terms of what they're supposed to spend it on is things like, like drainage, 
infrastructure in local government, um, health, garbage pickup, the, the day-to-day runnings uh, of, the, of the districts and the constituencies by extension. The, I would say, it, I would um, say the NTA view on it uh, is, aligns with my view on this, that you have to pay your taxes. We, we have to pay our taxes. Um, the government is entitled to your taxes. However, it doesn't mean that all taxes are fair. And one of the major issues with this, or the major issue I see with it anyway, is this. If I am paying property tax, why am I paying such a heavy and, and terrible, I would say, stamp duty? So what happens? Correct. So what happens is that remember something. Some properties will sell multiple times in a few years, and every time the government collects a large lump sum on that. So my view of it is either you have the property tax or you have stamp duty. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Yeah, because right now they are suffering people for double taxation when you do that, and that is my issue with that. But you know, some people say it's more than double taxation because I'm also paying tax on the material to bill. I'm also paying tax on the stuff I buy to put in. You know, I put it as spending tax. You know, well, we, we, I, we heavily tax in this country. While I don't agree with that entirely, I don't agree entirely with that. Uh-huh. You need to pay your taxes at every point in time for two or things, but I understand where you're coming from with it, right? Where you undergo a lot of financial strain to build a property. So perhaps maybe they could be looking into certain types of exemptions because I do believe in this, to keep taxes low because you, and especially in this time. So um, the, I believe the minister was saying that 10 billion, right, John? 10 billion. He estimates, he estimates 10 billion. He estimates that they can collect that on taxes. I'm not going to say anything about his projections on how they've been over the last um, 10 years, but okay, let's just go with 10 billion. In an economy that is decimated, an economy that is struggling, which is a trend to make economy right now, you know, we can't have any kind of um, any kind of delusion that it's it's going well and so on. It's not. The economy is not going well. So in economies like that, what you do is encourage spending, not saving. People have to spend their money. So and they only spend money in their hand. Correct. You have to have disposable income. So initiatives that will even lower the revenue streams of the government, if it encourages at this time more spending from disposable income, it will uplift the economy. And then in time now, in the long run, the government will be able to collect more and the country will do better as a whole. Just right. So, my friends, we're getting closer and closer to the time that we're going to be wrapping up this evening's discussion, right? So, as we move into that time, I want to, I'm going to start over with education again to find out, you know, in your heart and as a member of the National Transformation Alliance, what are you seeing for us with a government that is for national, that is national, that is for transformation and is interested in in leading with care, in governing with love. Tell how you feel about that. You know, one of the things I would say, you know, um, speaking on behalf of NC, I would advocate for a greater allowance to be given to Tobago. You would realize over the years, nobody have been focusing on the educational development aspect of Tobago. Our tertiary education students have to come to Trinidad to receive tertiary, to receive tertiary education. And if they are sidelined here in Trinidad, they have to go up the Caribbean, either to Grenada or, or Barbados. So, you know, I would advocate for us to put things in place to develop tertiary education institutes in Tobago so that these individuals will have the luxury of remaining at home with their families and also receive proper education. As well as, you know, we would put things in place in order to develop teams, digital teams, where we would have Nicolene speak about the issue um, in terms of maintenance, and we are seeing it as well happening in our education system. Our schools are dilapidated. You know, our children' conditions daily is very, very unacceptable. And when children have to learn under these conditions, how do you expect learning to take place under these conditions? Now, we will put things in place in that individuals are able to report within 24 hours and get results from reporting whatever is taking place within your schools. Teams would be established to be able to fix these issues before they become bigger issues. So repairs will also cause less because of the reporting factor and the time frame we take in order to fix these issues. As well as one of the things I would like to see is accountability taking place. 
we lack accountability within every department within our government currently. Under the NTA, we will ensure that we hold individuals accountable for what they are called to do. And with accountability, hand in hand with accountability, is measurement of performance. Correct. Yes. Go ahead. Tell me. No, if... I, oh. I was going to answer your, que yes, your yes. previous question. Your previous question. Is that yes. okay? Yes, yes, please. I am very excited, looking forward to working with continuing to work with the this team with the NTA and to see transformation, to see accountability, um, you know, and really making a change. And I want to see Trinidad like we knew Trinidad, what it was, how you felt. 25, 30, 35 years ago. And that's what I want to see and to feel safe once more. And I'm really looking forward to working with this team to achieve that. How about you, Nicolene? Yes, I would like to say that uh, stay in Trinidad 35 years ago, but I would like to see it better than how it was before. So working with the NTA, I am honored and I'm glad that we have a team that seeks empathy with the people and moving forward. I look forward to it. Thank you. Well, I see the team has been accountability tonight. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, but it is central to um, what we stand for, NT. And it is important to note that if you're not accountable, everything will fall apart because we have seen it fall apart without the accountability. So I am very honored to be on this panel. And, you know, thank, thank the host and the lovely ladies that uh, with tonight. Uh, it's definitely been a very forward thinking discussion. And I think that's what we need. We need to continue to have this forward thinking discussion. Uh, we need to be able to pan these out. And just my note on national security is this. We cannot let just how our agencies tend to work in silos, operating silos and uh, uh as an island onto itself, and it's this one myopic view on it, we need to look at national security as a whole, and we have to break the silos between the agencies of national security um, and within the agencies themselves. So th thank you very much again. Okay. I want to um, recount something that happened to me in St. Lucia. I arrived in St. Lucia. You sure you can give a story on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With, in a full aircraft. Yeah, okay, okay. And I was taken up by a taxi. This was in uh, down south in Beaufort. And we're driving up to head to the city to go to a hotel that I thought that's the hotel I was going to. The vehicle was in an accident, a really bad accident. Um, I came out of the vehicle. I was still able to walk. I still had my senses and so on. And they stopped another taxi to get me to the hotel because it's a visitor. They want to get me to the hotel. The hotel I got to, was not the hotel I was supposed to go to. So I had to make some calls, found out which it was, and the next taxi came and took me to that hotel. When I got to that hotel, I was really starting to feel more of the effects of the accident. I was feeling pins and needles and so on. So I tell them at the desk, and they called the doctor on call, who said, now nah, we have to get you to a hospital. Then they taken me to the Elizabeth, the friends of the, the general hospital. On my way there, I called an next friend who said, nah, came to this private hospital. Within 45 minutes, Paul and team of me ride, arriving at that hospital, a police officer was at my bedside in, interviewing me about the accident. But you have to go to the station and, yeah. and, and make a report. You know what I mean? Being an accident. You know what I mean? And, and look, I changed taxi. I changed hotel, I changed hospital. Within 45 minutes, a police officer was at the bed interviewing me about the accident. And that speaks volumes to me about interagency communication. Okay. It speaks volumes to me about caring, mm -hmm. leadership with some sort of caring, oh, some oh, sort oh, of oh, compassion, oh, oh. with love. And I look forward to those days that are ahead of us. And they are ahead of us. They are ahead of us. I look forward to it. How do you feel well, about that? When, what I'm hearing there is, is where I can see we have leaders who know what they're doing. We have people who are put into positions who know what, what their job, know the job to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you put a, 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 a fine, uh, someone who's in finance in finance. Correct. You put someone who's a doctor who's in medical in health. And when you do things like that, because these people don't have to guess and they don't have to ask their partner what to do. Sportsman, sportsman. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. As, as our political leader was always say, don't put square pegs in wrong holes. And that there is a clear example where a government was put in place 
they choose the people that they know could get the job done and then somewhere down the line they have a level of accountability oh, really? because if it wasn't for that accountability somebody might lose their job because you are a foreigner so you could go out to the outside world and say listen I had a bad experience in Lucia, mm -hmm. but you came here today and you are able to tell that glorious story. And that is what we want for Trinidad and Tobago one day, for both Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I want to add that things like that are possible when you have teams, where people work together, where there's an alliance that is moving in the same direction. So guys, I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank all of you at home also for joining us. Um, this is one NTA chat discussion type thing and there are so many more to come because there's so much for us to talk about, so much we want to talk about among ourselves and to share with you and to have you be able to participate. So until next time, this is part of the NTA governance team saying thank you and looking out for seeing you soon and keep your eyes peeled for some releases that are coming out from some members of our government governance team tomorrow. Good night, Trinidad and Tobago.